Chapter Eleven of Concerning Isabel Carnby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Concerning Isabel Carnby by Ellen Thornycroft Fowler. Chapter Eleven His Own People. Where thou goest, I will go, through the sunshine or the snow. Where thou dwellest, I will dwell, in a court or in a cell. All thy people, mine shall be, since myself is one with thee. It was the day of Isabel's arrival at Chaford, and Mrs. Seaton's face was pink with excitement and anxiety that everything should be as Paul wished for Paul's bride-elect. The tea-table was spread with every simple dainty that Martha could suggest and carry out, and was covered with Mrs. Seaton's best tablecloth, a specimen of the finest and most silky-looking damask, with an elegant border composed of arum lilies, and an effigy of John Wesley in the centre. I cannot help feeling a little nervous, said Mrs. Seaton. I am so anxious that everything should be as Paul would like. The minister smiled. My dear, you are careful and troubled about many things. If Isabel Carnby loves our Paul, as I believe she does, she will not notice what viands are spread out before her, nor what servants are ready to serve her. She will be so happy to feel herself in Paul's presence that minor matters will be of no moment to her. But I do want everything to be nice, persisted Mrs. Seaton plaintively. Don't worry so, mother, chimed in the sensible Joanna. We have done our best to prepare a warm welcome for Isabel, and if she isn't pleased it is her fault and not ours. But it is Paul I'm thinking of, not Isabel, said Mrs. Seaton. I should be so sorry to disappoint him in any way. My love, you really are overburdened with the cares of this life, replied her husband. Believe me, it is really of no importance what we eat and how we are clothed, provided we have wholesome food and garments beseeming our estate and it grieves me to see you wearing yourself out about things that do not signify. Well, I hope Paul will be satisfied, repeated Paul's mother. There they are, exclaimed Joanna, as a cab drove up to the door and Paul sprang out, followed by an extremely well-dressed young lady. The minister and his family went into the hall to receive their visitor, and Mrs. Seaton trembled all over for she felt it was an ordeal. So did Paul, and his mother knew that he did, as soon as she saw his face. Mother, this is Isabel, was all he could say. He was so dreadfully afraid that the two women he loved best in the world would not say the right things to one another. But Isabel was equal to the occasion. She threw her arms round Mrs. Seaton's neck and kissed her. I want you to be a mother to me as well as to Paul, she whispered. I haven't got a mother of my own, you know, and I do so want one. And then and there the minister's wife took Isabel into her motherly heart and never really let her out again, in spite of all that happened afterwards. When Isabel had duly greeted Mr. Seaton and Joanna, she was introduced to Martha. This is our faithful friend Martha, said Mrs. Seaton. She nursed Paul when he was a little boy. Isabel held out her hand with a radiant smile. I must thank you for taking so much care of him for me, she said. If you hadn't sown, I should not have reaped, so I owe much of my happiness to you. Don't mention it, miss, replied Martha, looking proud and joyful. It was always a pleasure to do things for Master Paul, in spite of his temper, which I am bound to say was one of the hottest I ever came across, while he was as yet a child of nature and not of grace. 
I bore the marks of his dear little teeth in my arm for many a day, miss, for once contradicting him when he said that Abraham was the father of Joseph. Bless his heart! Isabel laughed, and so did Paul. But don't let me discourage you, miss, if you've made up your mind to get married, added Martha, fearing that she had said too much. If you must have a husband, perhaps Master Paul is the best sort you'll get, though bad's the best, to my thinking, with regard to husbands. Tea that evening was a very cheerful meal at Chafer Cottage. Isabel was so charmed by the refinement and culture of Paul's home that she was at her best. She found herself in an atmosphere of intellectual activity such as she was accustomed to, but combined with a simplicity of life and a familiarity with higher things such as she had never yet known, and the combination was very attractive to her. I shall have much to ask about your life in India, my dear, said Mr. Seaton to Isabel, as they all sat round the tea table. I have always longed to go there and see for myself the remains of one of the world's oldest and most picturesque civilizations, but I never shall accomplish it now, so I must beg you to give me information second-hand. Martha is immensely impressed by you having lived in India, exclaimed Joanna, but she has deliciously vague ideas about the place. I think she pictures it to herself as a coral strand, covered with undressed niggers, like the picture on the cover of the missionary notices. I am not sure that my ideas of India are not a good deal like that, Paul said. Only I add a few elephants and pagodas. She asked me the other day, continued Joanna, still addressing Isabel, if I thought you had ever worshipped idols while you were in India. Isabel sighed. I am afraid I sometimes did, but they were not the native ones. Never mind, my dear, said Mrs. Seaton kindly. We have all of us worshipped idols at some time or another, except, of course, the minister. Her husband shook his head. I am afraid, my love, that I have worshipped idols too, only I bound them in vellum and called them by theological names. I expect we have all got a little museum of cast-off idols somewhere in our hearts, remarked Isabel which we now and then dust and put in order, added Joanna. Although they no longer used as idols, they are still interesting as curiosities, said Paul. I've got three fine ones in mine, called Rowing and Success and Power, and I dare not allow myself to take them out and dust them too often, for fear I should fall a worshipping of them once more. Dear old Paul, said his mother tenderly, I used to have two lovely ones called The World and Fashion, said Isabel, but Paul came by and knocked them over in passing, and I have never been able to set them up again. I have got a very bothering one named Duty, said Joanna, and it gives me a lot of trouble, because I am not quite sure whether it is an idol or not. Sometimes I think it is, and then I put it by in the museum, but at other times it seems to be a legitimate object of adoration, and then I have to restore it to its shrine. I never can decide where to keep the thing for two days together. That would worry me, remarked Isabel. There is nothing so wearing as dis indecision. But you are very undecided, Isabel, argued Paul. I know I am, and that is why I reprove this characteristic in other people. I feel sure I shall become an old woman before my time, though suffering agonies of indecision as to whether I shall take my waterproof to church or not, and how often I shall write to you in a week. What idols are in your museum, mother? inquired Joanna. Oh, my dear, when a woman is married there is no room in her heart 
for anything but God and her husband and her children, and then she has to be very careful lest her husband and her children should take up more than their share of room. Mr. Seaton smiled. I do not think you need be afraid, Ruth, for I believe that the more room we give in our hearts to our fellow creatures, the more room there is left for God. Paul will have to show you all about Chaford tomorrow, said Mrs. Seaton, turning to Isabel. It is a very pretty old town, and the surrounding country is lovely. Are you a good walker, my dear? I am as fond of walking as I am of talking, Mrs. Seaton, which is saying a great deal. In fact, I may confess I am as walkative as I am talkative. Walkative is a rather good word, I think. I've just invented it. It is capital, agreed Paul. Paul has told me about the people here, added Isabel. I already know them all by their names. I am sure I could pass an examination in Chaford and take honors. It will be fun to show you all the neighbors, exclaimed Joanna, and to see if they are like what you expect. How is Mrs. Martin? asked Isabel. Better than ever, was Joanna's reply. She has torn us under between her social respect for and her spiritual disapproval of you but she reconciles you to herself by measuring your position in this world and your prospects in the next by different measures like troy wait and avor du poy so that the two do not clash how very nice of her exclaimed isabel with delight she offended Martha dreadfully the last time she called here, continued Joanna, by saying that our cat's tail is too short for real Persian. Martha related it to me afterwards with great indignation, and added, as if the Lord didn't know how to make a cat without Mrs. Martin's interference. Everybody laughed. Then Isabel said, Martha, is a dear even in this present world i shall desire more love and knowledge of her she repays research remarked paul though i confess i think she would be more agreeable if her conscience were not so bent on setting both forth unflattering truths i do not ask for lies but even truth requires clothing Besides, it is not always necessary to say the whole truth about everything, says Mrs. Seaton. It is wrong to utter falsehood, but it is not wrong to keep silence. You mean that if a person had good eyes and an ugly mouth, you would tell her how pretty her eyes were and leave the mouth to speak for itself? suggested Isabel. Mrs. Seaton looked amused. That would be mother's plan, said Joanna. She never says anything that could hurt anybody's feelings. And I believe that, as a matter of fact, she would only look at the eyes and never notice that the mouth was ugly. She has a splendid habit of only seeing the good in people and things. That is quite true, agreed the minister. Joanna continued. I am sorry to say that unpleasant truths are a terrible temptation to me. I really don't mean to be disagreeable, but sometimes they fly out of my mouth before I have time to stop them. Miss Dallicott asked me yesterday if I liked her new bonnet, and I'd say no before I had time to weigh my words. I was extremely sorry afterwards. She looked so hurt. My child, said Mr. Seaton, you should consider other people's feelings, and strive never to give pain where it can be avoided. So I do, father, but now and then the truth is too strong for me, and I am sure that a glimpse of the bonnet itself will prove to you that I was not without provocation. What was it like? asked Isabel. It was a ghastly combination of black and white feathers and red flowers, replied Joanna, and it resembled a young person's funeral passing through 
a field of poppies it really was a weird sight thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not said mr seaton reprovingly and miss dalicott is a dear and valued friend of mine i am not forsaking her father i am only describing her headgear mr seaton smiled as he shook his head a man that hath friends must show himself friendly and ridicule and friendliness hardly seem to me compatible my child wait till you see the bonnet persisted joanna i for one am looking forward to the vision exclaimed paul when she comes into chapel on sunday i shall begin to sing the morning flowers display their sweets did i tell you that she tumbled down coming into chapel last sunday said joanna no did she i wish i'd been there to see cried the unrenner great paul yes she caught her foot on the mat of the door staggered up the aisle with increasing speed at every step and finally fell an inert mass at the pulpit steps while her parasol and pocket handkerchief and hymn book flew all over the chapel like leaves in autumn paul and isabel laughed heartily then the latter said my aunt had a similar misadventure the other day she sneaked into a shop in regent street to inquire the price of a carpet she had no intention of buying a mean trick as i told her and her sin found her out why what happened asked paul she likewise tripped on entering and ran a wild and reckless race the whole length of the shop brave young men sprang over the counter to stop her mad career and even the cashier rushed out of his little square pew to check her rapid flight but all in vain she outstripped them all and lay at last convulsed with laughter at the foot of a mirror at the very far end of the shop mrs seaton laughed till the tears ran down her face it really seems too bad to laugh at such things but i can never help it i hope lady farley was not hurt not in the least but you can picture her shame and humiliation when she had to confess to the crowd of young men collected to pick up her remains that she had only looked in to inquire the price of a carpet it was rather dreadful for her agreed mrs seaton still simmering with amusement i wish mrs martin did not just just before me in chapel sighed joanna why not asked paul because there is one white tacking thread left to the sully the glory of her otherwise immaculate sunday mantle and that tacking thread comes between me and my devotions i am torn between the desire to stretch forth my hand and pluck it out and my knowledge that mrs martin's tacking threads are no concern of mine you should try not to look at it my dear said mrs seaton so i do mother but the thing rises up and hits me in the face so to speak it is like gehazi in its unnatural whiteness i should let it stand said paul as an everlasting testimony to the truth that even mrs martin is human and not beyond the help of tacking threads to say my mind there is something infinite pathetic and poetical in the idea i feel i could write a poem on it if not a tract i know i should tell her about it some day remarked joanna i'm awfully interested in your passion for speaking the truth said isabel it is just the other way with me i always want to say what i feel people want me to say rather than what i think how funny but that is because it is your nature to make yourself pleasant it is fearfully difficult for me not to make myself disagreeable while to make myself agreeable is impossible replied joanna poor joanna said her mother joanna went on 
I know that people often blame me for saying disagreeable things, but if they were only knew how many disagreeable things I keep myself from saying, and how deeply I regret those I do say, they would commend rather than condemn me. Then Mr. Seaton questioned Isabel about her life abroad, and the conversation never flagged till it was time for Joanna to go to class, and for Paul and Isabel to start for a walk in the lanes round Chaford Cottage. Isabel's week at Chaford was a great success. The Seatons were charmed with her, and she was with them, and as she and Paul had nothing in the world to do but to make love to each other, there was no occasion for jealousies or misunderstandings between them such as came later in the conflicting interests of a London June. Isabel revered Paul's father, because he was so courteous and so saintly, and had read more than any man she had ever met. She liked Joanna, because Joanna was good and clever, and possessed a most admirable sense of humor and she loved Mrs. Seaton because the minister's wife was the first woman she had ever met who in some degree satisfied the mother hunger in her heart, and Mrs. Seaton understood Isabel better than any of them did, not excluding even Paul. She knew that there were depths in the girl's soul whereof Joanna did not dream, and which Paul had not yet sounded and that, in spite of her sunny light-heartedness, Isabel's nature was very highly strung. Mrs. Seaton trembled for them both when she realized that Paul's masterly touch might prove a little too heavy for so delicate an instrument, and that some of the strings might break under the pressure. But she knew herself powerless to interfere for she had learned that what we call influence other people often called impertinence, and that it is a power which is more prone to do harm than good. When people are seized with the desire to set about improving their neighbors, it is a phase of thought which might be described as the negative of the missionary spirit, that is to say, it is a form of spiritual instruction which has the effect of turning Christians into savages for the time being, at any rate. The only person at Chaford that Isabel did not get on with was Mrs. Martin. These two fell foul of each other from the first. Mrs. Martin began by being obsequious, and Isabel snubbed her and the man or woman who can forgive a social slight is as yet an undiscovered product of civilization. Human nature can only stand a certain strain, and social rudeness stretches this elasticity to its uttermost limit, if not beyond it. Mrs. Martin opened the ball by calling upon Isabel, decked out in her Sunday best. I am so glad to meet you, my dear Miss Carnby, she began, addressing herself pointedly to Isabel, and coolly excluding Mrs. Seaton and Joanna from the conversation. I feel sure we shall be friends, for your dear aunt's sake. I believe she is one of the Farleys of Ferngrove, and they were friends of my mother's years ago. I am afraid I must confess I never heard of the Farleys of Ferngrode, said Isabel rather stiffly. Did you not? Dear me, how strange! They were an old country family in Lancaster when my dear mother was a girl. Really quite a good old family, I can assure you, and she had the pleasure of meeting them once or twice in those happy old days. I really think your distinguished uncle must belong to the same family. They were most accomplished and extremely rich. I don't think so, said Isabel. Uncle Benjamin's money came to him from his mother's brother, who was in the iron trade, 
His father was a clergyman and was extremely poor. Mrs. Martin looked shocked. To her mind there was something indelicate in the mere mention of poverty. Her father had been extremely poor at the commencement of his commercial career, but she would have died rather than mention so disgraceful a fact. She wondered that Miss Carnby had not more refinement of feeling. Nevertheless, she made another attempt to establish a friendly footing between herself and this coarse-minded young woman. "'I wonder if you ever met my dear friends, the Sedleys,' she said. Isabel did not think so. "'They are charming people, dear Miss Carnby, and have such aristocratic connections. Only last year they were staying in the same hotel as the hereditary Grand Duchess of Edelweiss, somewhere in Switzerland. I forgot the name of the place, but I know it was most fashionable. The Sedleys never go to any but really fashionable resorts. How very interesting, murmured Isabel politely. You would delight in Mrs. Sedley. She is so extremely refined. She once told me that unless she always wore silk necks to her skin, she would die of irritation. It is not strange how good breeding shows itself in these small trifles. Very strange, said Isabel. You would hardly believe it, Miss Carnby. But do you know I am physically unable to wear cheap boots or gloves myself? If I attempted to do so, I should become lame and helpless at once. I said to my dear husband only yesterday, it is not that I wish to be extravagant, for I hold extravagance as a sin, but my skin is so delicate that the wear of cheap things is simply torture to me. I am sorry for you, replied Isabel, for the pleasure of the summer sails must be lost upon you. You cannot imagine how delightful they are. Lady Farley and I always attend them, and last season we took Lady Eleanor Gregory with us, and she reveled in the bargains even more than we did. Dear me, was all that Mrs. Martin could ejaculate? I remember, continued Isabel, that she brought a sealskin cape because they were so reduced, and she nearly died in he of heat in trying it on, for it was the hottest day of a very hot July. We were too warm in muslin blouses, and we sat laughing at poor Lady Eleanor as she tried on cape after cape, each one heavier than the last. Poor young lady, remarked Mrs. Martin sympathetically, I trust that thus overheating herself did not result in a chill. I remember a friend of mine, Mrs. Albert Simpkinson, died from the effects of a chill, bought on by overclothing herself on a warm day, and her premature disease was peculiarly unfortunate, for she died just as she was beginning to get into good society. Isabel's eyes twinkled wickedly, but she kept her lips in order and did not allow them time to relax into a smile. How sad, she murmured. It was indeed, sighed Mrs. Martin, only a fortnight before Mrs. Simpkinson's death, the Honorable Mrs. Avalon, daughter-in-law to the Earl of Glastonbury, called upon her, and she barely had time to return the call, much less to follow up the intimacy before she died. But though Isabel did not get on with Mrs. Martin, she looked at everybody else in Chaford through rose-colored glasses. To Martha she was specially gracious, and was described by that excellent woman as a sweet young creature. Master Paul is a lucky man, and no mistake, said Martha one day, luck being only another name for a good strong will of your own. Coupled with the help of Providence, 
as my mother james said when he induced mr hickory to leave the grumpton circuit who was mr hickory inquired isabel who always appreciated martha when the latter became retrospective mr hickory was a young minister with new-fangled notions who travelled in grampton for one year and then my brother james induced him to leave didn't your brother like his preaching asked james no not at all miss not at all but it wasn't only his preaching that james objected to though that was far from satisfactory being more full of modern science falsely so called than of saving truth james never liked mr hickory's views on the devil he thought them broad and dangerous but it was not the devil that they quarrelled over after all it was the heating apparatus in grampton chapel james said he'd have overlooked the devil if mr hickory had given way about the heating apparatus as we must all give and take in this world but mr hickory's attitude in the matter was more than he could or would stand isabel looked deeply interested and so did joanna what was the end of it asked the former well miss you see james said that the old heating apparatus had been good enough for the congregation for twenty years and more and if it was good enough for them it was good enough for mr hickory and it shouldn't be altered as long as he was chapel steward but the minister was set on having some new-fangled arrangement of his own and the minister got his own way james was overruled and the new apparatus was set up in grampton chapel was it a success a success miss carnby who ever heard of an improvement of any kind being a success i never did give me the old-fashioned things say i and don't meddle with them for i never met with an improvement that wasn't for the worse you are a consistent conservative martha and i admire you laughed isabel thank you miss i don't go in for politics and all that rubbish but i keep my eyes open and see things for myself and judge accordingly and a very wise plan agreed isabel that is as may be miss but how about the new heating apparatus and your brother james suggested joanna well miss james never could say if it was a judgment from heaven or whether it was because the chapel keeper put too much coal on but anyhow the whole thing caught fire and burnt part of the wall before it could be put out was much of the wall burnt asked isabel a nice piece miss joanna smiled was that why the minister left well miss after that mr hickory said that he had made a mistake and my brother james advised him to leave grampton and begin again elsewhere before he went james told him he would do well if he set about helping folks to get new hearts and left their old beating apparatus alone which was good advice to my thinking though it was my own brother as gave it the happy days at chafer passed all too quickly when sunday came isabel went with paul to hear his father preach and she never forgot her first service in chaford chapel she possessed the artistic temperament to an unusual extent and therefore beauty in worship strongly appealed to her whether it were shown in ornate ritual or in extreme simplicity to such natures as hers a stately cathedral filled with the voice of a great multitude and a bleak 
hillside where a handful of persecuted conventeurs are assembled seem alike the house of god and the gate of heaven for the artist soul is slow to discern the theological differences of the two or three gathered together but it is quick to perceive and to prostrate itself before the perfect beauty of the one in the midst of them isabel carmby was an extremely emotional woman and consequently experienced the quick vision of the truth and the rapid clouding over of the same which are the portion of all emotional temperaments as she sat beside paul in chaford chapel that sunday morning she was at her best her love for him simulated the religion and stifled the worldly side of her character herein lay the fundamental difference between herself and joanna joanna was a good woman because she loved god isabel was a good woman because she loved a good man a lower type perhaps from a spiritual point of view but one none the less to be considered since the vessels in a great house are not all of equal honor and the stars in the firmament are not all the same glory the minister preached a beautiful sermon on love as the fulfillment of the law and isabel listened her soul was uplifted and her understanding quickened she made up her mind that however she might fail in other things the forgiveness accorded to them that love much should always be her right and that she would never allow clouds of doubt and misunderstanding to arise between her and those whom it was her duty to love and to cherish them she vowed she would love to the end and all others for their sakes it seems to isabel an easy thing sitting in the quaint little chapel and listening to the minister's silvery voice to love both the brother whom she had seen and the god whom she had not seen but many things look easy from the mount of transfiguration which grow difficult if not impossible amid the rabble of jerusalem the hymn after the sermon was there is a land of pure delight and it thrilled isabel through and through as she and paul sang it together she felt for them the everlasting spring had already begun and the never withering flowers were theirs because they loved each other so paul and isabel rested for a while upon the delectable mountains and imagined that they were even now in paradise but they forgot how it is written that a little below these mountains on the left hand lieth the country of conceit from which country there comes into the way in which the pilgrims walked a little crooked lane john bunyan knew what he was talking about when he described the country of conceit as lying close under the shadow of the delectable mountains end of chapter eleven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter Twelve of Concerning Isabel Cranby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Concerning Isabel Cranby by Ellen Thornycroft Fowler. Chapter Twelve a feast of good things they talked of things created long and things but lately come to pass down from the swan of avon's song to sounds evolved from glass with the exception of the setons there was no one at chaford that isabel carnby liked so well as the fords for she felt as most people did 
who were brought under the spell of its influence the fascination of chaford house it was a most attractive home with its huge stone gateway in front forming the full stop to chaford high street and its beautiful park at the back studded with fine old elms and sloping down to the river and not the least picturesque feature in one of the prettiest parks in mercer was chaford cottage nestling among the trees and covered with purple clematis and scarlet virginia creeper in their season chaford house was equally interesting within and without it was one of the delightful houses where the drawing-room is merely an edition de luxe of the library and when all is said and done there is no drawing-room paper as effective as vellum and half-calf michael ford had been as the irishman said a rich man for several generations and his home bore the hallmark of a century's refinement and luxury he had all the geniality of a man who had never had a misunderstanding much less a fight with circumstances and there was not a grain of bitterness in his composition he was a wesleyan and his fathers and had been before him but he gave as generously to the anglicans and the independents in chaford as he gave to his own church and his gifts to all were munificent he was sensible rather than scholarly and wise rather than learned in politics he was a whig of the old school and the only disappointment of his otherwise successful life was that he had been compelled by business engagements to abandon his cherished desire for a parliamentary career but he intended this for his son in his place and the object of his ambition was to see edgar member for chaford on the liberal side edgar's character inherited from some far-off puritan ancestor was incomprehensible to his father but mr ford shared the common and comfortable parental delusion that the perfect acquiescence of children in their parents views is merely a question of time it was strange that while mark seaton's son made an idol of success michael ford's son made a moloch of conscience yet mark seaton's affections were set entirely on things above and michael ford possessed common sense to a degree which almost raised it to the level of genius but these things happen during isabel's week at chaford she saw a great deal of edgar he understood her better than paul did and therefore he did not fall in love with her mutual comprehension makes for friendship and mitigates against love for love like modern society papers must have a puzzle column for the mystification of those that take it in isabel's emotional temperament was nearer skin to edgar's mysticism than to paul's dogged determination so she and edgar became good friends and there was no element of danger in their friendship it was characteristic of edgar in the days when he believed that paul loved alice his conscience forbade him to speak to the girl because he wanted to do so but in the days when paul loved isabel edgar talked to her freely simply because such conversation gave him no particular pleasure to make himself miserable was an irresistible temptation to edgar ford on the eve of isabel's return to town there was a small dinner party at chaford house in addition to the four seatons and their guest the company included the rev henry stonery rector of chaford and his popular wife mr matterly an artist who was painting mrs ford's portrait and alice martin after the migration into the dining-room mr ford began does any one know the result of the sidbury election i have heard nothing authentic replied the rector 
but I have good reasons for believing that the conservative has been returned. That is what I expected, exclaimed his host. The liberals are divided into two camps with two separate leaders, namely the regular liberal and a labor candidate, and if our people will persist in thus splitting up their forces, your people are always bound to get in. That is quite true, said Mrs. Ford. Conservatives have learnt the lesson of obedience to their leaders. Have you ever noticed, remarked Isabel Carnby, that when it comes to the point, a conservative will vote for the worst conservative rather than for the best liberal, while a liberal will rather not vote at all than support a candidate who does not share his every prejudice. Mr. Stoneley smiled. Our people certainly know how to pull together. And our people don't, added Mr. Ford. That is the weakness of the Liberal Party. Each individual is too fond of thinking out things for himself, and judging from his own limited observation rather than from the experience of wiser men. I beg your pardon, father, said Edgar, but I should call that the strength of the Liberal Party. Surely consciousness and reasonable support is better than blind and unreasoning obedience. More gratifying to the individual, perhaps, replied his father, but disastrous to the party. Moreover, added the rector, it does not do for every man to be a law unto himself. Liberty carried too far degenerates into anarchy. If every man does what is right in his own eyes, what becomes of law and order? suggested Mr. Seaton. Strength is shown in self-suppression rather than by self-glorification. Precisely, agreed the rector. The whole crux of civilization seems to me to lie in the fact that the savage does not does what is best for himself, and the civilized man what is best for the community at large. And government is but a great mutual insurance society against human selfishness," added Mr. Seaton. I quite agree with that, said Mr. Ford. With suppression of self is the end and aim of civilization, as well as Christianity. Just so, my dear madame, just so. Nevertheless, I should not say that conservatives do not think out matters for themselves, objected the rector, for they do. Oh, don't say that, cried Isabel. Do not, at one fell swoop, take away the one virtue of the conservative party. The rector smiled. Loyal old Tory as I am, I should not wish to recommend my party to alien eyes by assuming virtues which has it them not, my dear young lady. But, persisted Edgar, I never can understand why what is wrong for an individual can be right for a party or a state. That is beside the mark, interpolated Mr. Ford. Edgar looked puzzled. They were always so clear to his father, and they were hardly ever clear to him. He groped after the truth, but he often failed to grasp it. Obedience is right in all men, said Mr. Seaton, whether they be taken as individuals or as communities. To submit to authority is one of man's highest and most important duties. Quite so, quite so, agreed the rector. Yet now a day's people are in sad danger of forgetting this. Do you think so? said Paul Seaton. For my part, I consider that the modern enthusiasm for games and athletics of all kinds is a powerful antidote to individualism and fatism and their attendant follies. Therefore, if I had my way, I would insist on every man's taking up a game of some kind and becoming proficient in it. And a very good plan, cried the rector heartily, a very good plan indeed. You see, continued Paul, as long as England had to fight for her existence among the nations, 
there was no talk about each particular Englishman's special prejudices and crochets. This is one of the evils following in the train of peace and plenty. But by teaching our boys to go in for games, we in a measure obviate this. A man who is good at rowing or cricket or football has had to some extent a soldier's training and so will probably possess a soldier's virtues my son said mr seaton never say a word in favor of war it is an invention of the devil and no good can come of it still good has come of it persisted paul the full-grown sons of a warlike state are neither women nor children they are essentially manly our idea of manliness is not the true one said mr seaton physical courage has done so much for the man that it has won undue admiration from both the barbarism and civilization yet it is but a savage virtue at the best that is quite true exclaimed edgar ford mr seaton continued my son has just pointed out that war makes men the very opposite of women and children. There I agree with him, but I cannot forget that it is written, Except ye become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. War is a terrible thing, sighed Mrs. Ford. I can never understand how Wordsworth could write a poem in favor of it. I expect he was sick of behaving pretty and writing about primroses and pet lambs and weathercocks, and he felt he should like to have a regular flare-up just for once and shock every one, suggested Isabel. I have often felt like that myself. Everybody laughed, and then the rector said to Paul, You are quite right in what you say about athletics being a good antidote against fads. Fads being the ruin of any political party, added Mr. Ford. But a man's duty to his own conscience comes before his duty to the state, said Edgar, and I cannot see that any one is justified in defending a course of action which he considers wrong simply because his party is pledged to that course in politics as in scene painting murmured mr matterly i suppose one has to consider general effects rather than minute details and the pre-raphaelite school would not be effective from a political standpoint added mr ford the artist shrugged his shoulders I am not sure that it is from an artist artistic one. Are you not? Then I am afraid I shall have to quarrel with you, Mr. Matterly, said his hostess. Then you will have to quarrel with the rector too, and I will help you, remarked Mrs. Stoneley. Although I have been devoted wife to him for forty years, he quarrels regularly with me every academy because i like looking at pictures that he says are without perspective i know the sort cried isabel dear little scriptural things like tame and domestic church windows it is just like men to bother about perspective added mrs stoneley they are so literal poor dears that it is not safe to leave anything to their imaginations Besides, you cannot leave anything to something which does not exist. The rector smiled. Pardon me, my love. This consideration never hinders me from leaving many things to your discretion. Well, Henry, you never heard me fussing about perspective, whatever else I may have done. Certainly not, my love. A desire for perspective presupposes a sense of proportion. Never mind him, Miss Carnby, said his wife. You and I will go to the academy together, and leave him at home to study perspective from the rectory windows. The rector turned to Edgar. I think that the idea of duty to one's own conscience is growing to abnormal proportions, 
and is in great danger of degenerating into a morbid and unhealthy egotism as far as my experience goes if a man fulfills his duty towards god and his duty towards his neighbor he will not have much time left for works of superegoation but are not one's duties towards god and one's duties towards one's own conscience synonymous asked edgar mr stoneley thought for a moment not necessarily i should say one's duty towards god is clearly defined in our good old church catechism but one's duty towards one's own conscience is an elastic term which may include anything from religious persecution to anti-vaccination mr ford chuckled approvingly quite true as a distinguished politician once said politics is the science of the second best remarked paul therefore we must recognize the truth that in political strife we can only approximately approach an ideal precisely agreed his host everything in this world is a matter of compromise i cannot admit that cried edgar with eagerness to me compromise is a detestable word it is our business to aim at perfection and to be satisfied with nothing less the fact that we may fail in our endeavor to attain our ideal in no way lessens our obligation to follow after it but the danger is said his mother that if we go in for perfection or nothing we shall in all probability get nothing i am afraid we must all be content with the second best in this world remarked mrs seaton yes added isabel like the man who said that as perfection in female beauty did not exist he was looking out for a wife who could cook a potato properly certainly half a loaf is better than no bread suggested paul edgar shook his head as long as people are content with half loaves they will never get whole ones first let them be sure they want whole ones suggested mr matterly exactly cried mrs stoneley people spend half their lives crying for things which would make them cry still more if they got them whole loaves would be very fattening in the first place continued the artist nothing would induce me to take one are you afraid of getting fat inquired isabel i never think of that this dread is the one cloud on my horizon dear lady the one discord in my life's harmony you happy thin people do not know what troubles flesh is heir to nor what fears do you think bread so dangerous asked isabel the more fattening thing in the world i had a friend who said he once inadvertently asked for bread and he gained a stone in a week isabel laughed then let us be content with only half a loaf and if we value our figures we had better have that toasted contentment is often only an euphemism for cowardice said edgar i am afraid as paul did not agree with you remarked mr seaton edgar smiled one of the reasons why he was so lovable was that he never lost his temper nor turned rusty in an argument s paul added godliness to the prescription however before he recommended it for general use he said pleasantly mr seaton laughed it seems to me continued edgar that to bind oneself down to follow any particular party through thick and thin is to do despite to one's own individuality you know nothing at all about it exclaimed his father the rector looked serious individualism carried to the excess soon becomes rebellion nevertheless persisted edgar it is one's duty to do what we think right regardless of results we know what was said of them who did evil that good might come now we are afraid to do good lest evil may come and i think that our condemnation is as just as theirs i should be sorry to lead a party composed entirely of edgar's paul remarked 
there would be a regular giant's causeway of rocks ahead mr ford nodded paul's straightforward common sense always appealed to him there you go again cried edgar caution is your watchword and it is a word i hate so do i agreed isabel all the mistakes of my life have arisen out of caution so have all the successes of mine added mr ford dryly mrs ford looked anxiously at isabel i trust that your horror of caution does not extend to matters affecting your health my dear it is never safe for any one to run risks and you do not look at all strong isabel laughed and paul felt a sudden tightening of the muscles round his heart and a moment's unreasoning hatred of mrs ford who does not know the bitter loathing that we all feel when someone suggests to us that our nearest and dearest are not looking well such speakers are probably kind or at worst only careless but we hate them more than we hate the foes who wish to injure us mrs ford has been looking after my health too said the artist his hostess smiled i only said i would not allow him to work too hard while he was here and i advised him to take a glass of new milk at tea-time the new milk is making a new man of me said mr matterly looking gratefully at mrs ford for all his quizzing now milk really is a fattening thing isabel said shaking her head so is water is it dear lady i never take it then you ought to i always do the fairest flowers demand their due murmured the artist bowing to isabel an artist like poets and muses and people of that sort live upon nectar i presume she retorted certainly replied mr matterly it is always a case of nectar or nothing with us i know it is ignorant of me said joanna but i always confuse nectar with manna so do i echoed alice i don't believe that people would be satisfied with manna nowadays said isabel they would want something more spicy than angel's food other times other mannas murmured the artist isabel laughed again and paul wondered how any man could be such an idiot as to make puns he did not quite realize that he would have laughed himself if isabel had not done so and would have thought matterly an amusing fellow but he did not like isabel's evident amusement at all the conversation flowed on pleasantly all through dinner and everybody was happy except alice but the sight of paul's obvious devotion to isabel proved a large fly in her ointment it did not make her wild with jealousy as it would have made some women nor hard and bitter as it would have made others it merely reduced her to a humble and pitiful condition of mind in which she wanted her mother to comfort her or else another man to make love to her as paul was making love to isabel it was so easy for a woman to create a new heaven and a new earth for herself especially the former out of whatever she may have at hand she must have a heaven of some kind however scanty may be the materials wherewith she has to build just as a little girl must have a doll if it be only a bundle of rags tied round with a string but men do not understand this to them the manufacture of a new heaven and a new earth is not so simple they cannot so easily sweep away the historical ruins of their past and erect a fresh fabric upon the old foundations for men are strong to do and still harder task to do without they can live after a fashion without a heaven at all and would rather do so than have a jerry-built edifice made up out of scraps they have not themselves chosen but to women poor souls a heaven of some kind is a necessity of their being and although the new one may not be formed after their ideal 
pattern like the old it is better than nothing and will probably in the end make them quite happy therefore alice feeling herself left out in the cold when she saw paul and isabel together was in the state of mind that she would have accepted and actually fall in love with edgar had he availed himself of those circumstances to propose to her but poor edgar had never learnt the art of making slaves out of circumstances he was a good man and chivalrous and he always did the right thing but he invariably chose the wrong time for doing it just then he felt particularly tender towards alice he saw that she saw how paul's face softened at the sight of isabel and he realized that every sign of affection shown towards isabel by paul was a fresh thorn in alice's path edgar argued that if he lost alice no other woman could comfort him and that therefore alice having lost paul no other man could comfort her he forgot that love to a man is like health he can exist after a fashion without it though he cannot attain to a high standard of happiness but that love to a woman is like life she must have it in some form or another or else she will die it is interesting to notice that the men who happen to be in love always join the ladies in advance of the others consequently paul and edgar did not sit long over their wine paul went straight up to isabel and edgar with his ready instinct to help anybody who was hurt asked alice to come and see a new and rare orchid that was in the conservatory after they had duly admired the orchid they sat down beside the cool marble fountain edgar longed to take alice in his arms and kiss her she looked so pretty and so sorrowful but instead of that he began to talk about the sidbury election i shall be sorry if the tory has got in he said it will vex my father and i cannot bear to see him disappointed he spoke at sidbury last week and made such a capital speech did he said alice she was wondering whether paul would have loved her if she had been as clever as isabel but though it grieves me to see him disappointed continued edgar i am afraid it will some day be my duty to disappoint him more than any one it will nearly break my heart and yet i fear i shall be obliged to do it how dreadfully sad murmured alice she was thinking that after all isabel was not nearly as good-looking as she was and that most men consider beauty far more important than brains in a woman it is cruel work alice when one's duty and one's affections clash i sometimes wonder if my duty to my father is not more binding than my duty to my own conscience yet if i acted as though wrongly in order not to vex my father i fancy such a course would be the doing of evil that good might come alice sighed i expect it would she was wishing she had been clever instead of pretty it seemed to pay better in the long run after all edgar went on i cannot help feeling that political life in a measure blunts one's finer perception and lowers one's ideals of course i see with my father that from the party point of view a certain amount of unanimity is imperative but from the personal point of view i cannot see that a man is justified in sacrificing his own principles and the expression of them to any consideration whatsoever of course not said alice she was wondering if paul talked to isabel about political and personal points of view and if isabel had any idea what it all meant you see alice the sermon on the mount is as binding now as it was eighteen centuries ago yet who now gives his cloak to them that take his coat or who strives to be meek and merciful and poor in spirit alice looked at edgar 
he was a handsomer man than paul and much more religious she wondered she did not like him as well it is very difficult for me to talk about things i really care for he continued his eyes bright with excitement i never do it to anybody except you but you are different from everybody else i cannot reconcile to my conscience the present attitude of the rich towards the poor that is what troubles me so much does it i am so sorry said alice gently she was grieved for Edgar to be unhappy but she wondered that he let a trifle such as this make him so yes i cannot get it out of my mind when the charge is brought against us i was a stranger and ye took me not in do you think it will be enough to answer lord there were the workhouses and the poor rates and the indiscriminate charity was supposed to pauperize the lower classes alice shook her head of course not then what ought we to do or rather what ought i to do for it is my own beam that i must be looking after and not my brother's moat oh alice i think of this night and day and yet i come to no satisfactory conclusion poor edgar alice was really sympathetic now conversation about politics did not interest her it was completely over her head but here was a man in trouble crying out for help and comfort this she understood well enough and her woman's heart longed to comfort him i cannot bear to grieve my father sighed edgar he has always been such a good father to me and you have always been such a good son to him i have tried to be but that is not enough the young man in the gospels has evidently been a good son as he has kept all the commandments nevertheless he was called upon to sell all that he had and give to the poor but there are lots of good men who don't sell all they have to give to the poor suggested alice and yet there is no doubt that they are quite as religious as you are and quite as conscientious i see that agreed edgar but every one is not called upon to make the same sacrifice a man who is called to preach the gospel has no right to disregard that call because some other man has not received it we are each appointed to our separate work and each man has got to do his own work and not somebody else's because he thinks that would suit him better alice called mrs ford from the drawing-room come and give us some of your charming music my dear so alice went to the piano and sang robin adair in a voice to which nature had given sweetness and sorrow had added expression while she sang edgar felt a lump in his throat and again longed to take her in his arms and console her and isabel's eyes filled with tears as she realized that what made london balls so fine and crowded assemblies so brilliant was the presence of paul seaton while paul himself hoped that alice's song would soon be over so that he might go on talking to isabel end of chapter twelve recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirteen of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter thirteen the country of conceit safe screened by hills on either hand from winter storms and summer heat there lies a silly little land the country of conceit one afternoon not long after isabel's visit to chayford paul was having tea at the farley's house in prince's gate and lady s dale was there also looking prettier than ever 
paul was feeling particularly happy as he had done ever since isabel had made herself at home among his own people she had fulfilled even his ideal of her and consequently he was content he had yet to learn that the fact of a woman's being an angel in may is no ground for supposing that she will be equally angelic in june or even angelic at all isabel with her fatal aptitude for taking her tone from her surroundings was as earthly in london as she had been heavenly at chaford that is to say the outward and visible isabel was and poor paul with all his love for her as yet lacked the wisdom to understand her thoroughly it always seems a pity with regard to love-making that when people are old enough to have learnt the game properly they are generally too old to want to play at it in this respect it is inferior to whist isn't london adorable just now exclaimed isabel everything is in such a rush that one has not time to think about anything rather a doubtful advantage i should say suggested paul not at all i hate thinking it makes my head ache replied isabel flippantly paul looked surprised and puzzled was this the same woman who had sat beside him in chaford chapel and sung there is a land of pure delight he did not know that isabel's character was as yet so unformed that she was frightened at the depth of her own feelings and that this was a feeble protest on her part against an emotion that was threatening to overwhelm her lady estelle shook her head mr seaton is right it is shocking not to have time to think the other day i was actually putting on a gown for the wallingford's dinner that i had worn there once before simply because i was in such a hurry that i had not time to give proper attention to my wardrobe fortunately my maid happened to remember in time but think how awful it would have been if i had worn the same dress at the same house twice in one season dreadful agreed isabel it is wonderful what an effect clothes have on one's character personally i have not the courage to show myself if i do not feel i am suitably attired a characteristic which i inherit from my first parents lady farley laughed i think our conversation is greatly affected by our clothes she remarked i can never administer a social snub properly unless i am wearing either fur or diamonds and i couldn't possibly pray in a hat or without a veil i quite agree with you caroline said lady estelle i cannot bear to see a married woman of my age in church in a hat and yet the unmarried ones look all right isn't it funny that a little thing like getting married should make all the difference between wearing a hat or a bonnet on sunday very funny replied lady farley but great effects do result from small causes constance they certainly do i came upon an instance of that only the other day the featherstone howe's cook died suddenly and so mabel featherstone howe was sent off straight to the ellisons as anything of that kind in a house is so unpleasant you know of course it is remarked lady farley with her satirical smile lady estelle continued willie phillipson happened to be staying at the ellisons at the same time and was so taken with mabel that i shouldn't be surprised if he made her an offer it would be an awfully good match for her and yet if the featherstone house cook had not happened to die just then she and willie might never have met each other paul laughed this speech was so exactly like lady estelle and its flippancy did not irritate him at all but he was conscious that if isabel had said such a thing he would have felt more angry than he could express isabel also was conscious of this and resented it she argued that if paul really cared for her he would approve of everything she said and did paul on the contrary argued that because he really cared for her it was agony to him when she said and did the things that he did not approve of consequently in speaking of a woman the word consequently is applicable here had it been a man that was referred to such an expression as strange to say would have been better consequently isabel ran full tilt against all paul's prejudices and theories aunt caroline is right in saying that our conversation depends upon our clothes she said mine is entirely guided by them 
oh no it isn't ejaculated paul you are talking nonsense pardon me my dear sir i am not i must know better than you do what are the sources of my own wit have you never noticed that i am subdued in black poetical in blue innocent in green and brilliant in yellow and what in white asked lady estelle with interest white i never wear aunt constance for the dual reason that my hairs are dark and my years are many but it is so economical persisted lady estelle if you wear white people never remember it and they never remember me either added isabel i look so very plain in it i am afraid we are shocking mr seaton said lady estelle sweetly he looks so serious but that is the worst of men they despise us if we try to look nice and they ignore us if we don't come lady estelle we are not quite as bad as that lady estelle sighed yes you are and then again you hate us for getting old and you laugh at us for trying to keep young you really are tiresome creatures paul was amused i own we are hard upon you when you tell fibs about your ages because such fibbing seems so foolish to us when will women learn to be as proud of being old as they are now of being young when men admire old women as much as young ones and not a moment before replied isabel smartly every one laughed i believe men really care as much about their clothes as we do about ours continued lady estelle only they don't talk about them as much but that is because they are so reserved and queer i have noticed men never talk about what they are thinking about isn't it funny of them i expect it is because they are so clever they can't hide what they feel the fools care about their clothes but the clever ones are too clever to see that they are not clever enough to be independent of trifles said isabel throwing the gauntlet down before paul but he was too wise to pick it up just then though he knew perfectly well that it was there so she rattled on i wonder if it would be possible for a woman to love a man well enough to condone his excellencies and to pardon his virtues love has accomplished some wonderful parlor tricks i admit but i don't think it has ever gone so far as to throw a halo round a man with a conscience don't you said paul dryly i fancy you somewhat underrate the powers of the little blind god and overrate the folly of your own sex don't have too much faith in my own sex advised isabel do not quarrel my children murmured lady farley the weather is too warm for anything but peace lady estelle rose she always left the room when any signs of a storm were brewing and therefore had the character of being a peacemaker i must be going she said i have so many calls to pay this afternoon good-bye dear people lady farley went downstairs with her sister-in-law and left the lovers to themselves there was a moment's silence and then paul asked whatever possessed you to talk such nonsense as you have been doing this afternoon you didn't mean a word of it isabel pouted she did not like to be scolded she was not accustomed to it i did mean it i'd as soon talk to a man with a hobby as a man with a conscience they are both boring you wouldn't and you do yourself an injustice when you say things like that isabel felt really cross now and then paul's superiority irritated her and she kicked against it this was one of the occasions i wish a touch of human nature was added to the thousand and one excellencies which beset you she said it would make you more amusing in this world without in the least interfering with your chances for the next i am human enough goodness knows no no my dear sir believe me you flatter yourself you are a rechauffe of king arthur and jack the giant killer flavoured to taste with extracts from the fairchild family paul smiled somewhat grimly nevertheless you were kind enough to select me as your future husband not unless i might have another for working days your grace is too costly to wear every day but you will be just the thing for sundays you are very cross this afternoon said paul trying to be pleasant but now you are coming for a walk with me and that will do you good no i'm not paul looked surprised 
why not you said that you were i dare say i did but i've changed my mind but why it is such a lovely afternoon and it is now cool enough for walking isabel looked at paul from under her long eyelashes he had been disagreeable and she felt it her duty to punish him she was a strict disciplinarian where her lover was concerned and never let her own feelings hinder her from giving him such chastisement as she thought needful to do them justice however it is but fair to add that her feelings were very accommodating in this respect and rarely attempted to stand between paul and the consequences of his misdeeds on the contrary they rather enjoyed the fulfilment of the decrees of inexorable justice i don't want to go out this afternoon because lord wrexham said he might call she replied inexorable justice was satisfied the sentence if out of proportion to the crime was exactly suited to the criminal isabel was a connoisseur in punishments the victim was silent for a moment then he said you ought not to have made any engagement for this afternoon after you had promised to go out with me your time was not your own i don't care whose it was anyhow i mean to take it and use it as i like but you have no right to isabel laughed bah who talks about rights nowadays nobody has really any right to anything except sufficient earth to bury them i shall do what i want then do you mean to say you want to stay in and see lord wrexham isabel nodded confound him said paul savagely there you are human after all cried isabel triumphantly i always said i was it was you that stated the opposite if you remember there is no doubt that the point is now proved beyond dispute but it is my statement that you have supported not your own i think jealousy is a disgusting fault said isabel i think so too but that doesn't cure it at any rate you will admit that it is extremely human isabel shook her head sorrowfully though she was really enjoying herself immensely it is very wrong and horrid and so like a man i believe the reason why paradise was paradise to adam was because he was the only man on the ground very probably and the old adam is so strong in me in spite of your remarks to the contrary that i mean to be the only man on the ground too you've got a horrid temper paul you are like the man who always quarrelled with people till they liked him you will never make anybody do what you want if you go on in that way oh yes i shall there is only one person in the world that i wish to do what i want and she will do it in twenty minutes from now isabel tossed her head oh dear no she won't oh dear yes she will how shall you make her i shall not make her she will do what i wish her to do partly because it is right but chiefly because i wish it and she wishes to please me isabel's face grew very red you are simply vile and detestable and altogether horrid i am quite aware of that and therefore it is all the more wonderful that a woman who is simply delightful and brilliant and altogether charming should be ready to do as i wish isabel shrugged her shoulders nothing will induce me to go out this afternoon nothing paul smiled and was silent isabel stamped her foot i'm not going to walk about london with a nasty disagreeable man and i tell you so once for all paul looked at his watch sixteen minutes before we start i do not want to hurry you but i know you like plenty of time to tie your veil and to see that your hair is all right isabel looked very cross you are the most detestable man i ever met that may be but as i remarked before your feeling is what the old hymn terms well dissembled well i do hate you all right if this is hatred i am well content with it and i would not change places with the people whom you love for worlds isabel looked at herself in the glass if there is one thing i despise more than another she remarked to her reflection it is a woman who does what a man tells her again paul found refuge in silence and smiles isabel hummed a tune out of patience twelve minutes before we start said paul apropos of nothing isabel stole a look at him what should you do if i didn't go she asked paul pulled his moustache to hide a smile 
you would soon see what i should do he said cautiously he had learned that the terrors of the unknown evaporate with fuller knowledge so he did not enlighten isabel moreover he would have found a difficulty in so doing as he did not know himself what should you do she persisted like the story of old grouse in the gun-room my programme is all the more effective for not being told i don't believe you know what you would do don't i though and there was laughter in paul's eyes besides he added what is the use of providing for impossible contingencies it is the impossible that always happens said isabel except when it is the unexpected corrected paul isabel pulled a yellow rose out of her belt and began picking it to pieces why are you so keen on making me go out with you this afternoon she asked because i want to enjoy the pleasure of being with you and because every man has a right to his own then you don't care about my pleasures pardon me i care so much about it that if i thought it really was a greater pleasure to you to stay in and see lord wrexham than to go out with me i would never ask you to go out with me again but i don't think so and that makes all the difference you are jealous of lord wrexham that is the long and short of it said isabel possibly replied paul dryly i never heard such rubbish and isabel plucked at the rose with impatient fingers paul looked at his watch again just five minutes he murmured as if to himself i hate you cried isabel stamping her foot i know you said so a short time ago and i told you that your hatred was the best thing in life if you remember repetition is not argument my dear isabel isabel did not answer but in spite of her hatred she ran upstairs and put her hat and gloves on and was down again before the twenty minutes had elapsed and she did not know that while she was out of the room paul picked up the remnants of the rose she had played with and kissed them before he slipped them into his pocket-book people generally called paul seaton a hard man they would have changed their opinion if they had seen his face when he kissed isabel's shattered rose but paul was not the sort of man to kiss roses when there was any chance of being seen when isabel came downstairs she looked so nice that paul pursued the same course of treatment with her that he had pursued with the yellow rose and with even greater satisfaction to judge by the expression of his face why do you like me so awfully she asked because you are you and because you are mine haven't we been horrid to each other this afternoon paul smiled i have been horrid but you are never anything but charming sweetheart oh i know i'm none the less charming for being horrid sometimes and to tell the truth neither are you i believe that we are both nicest when we are nasty and that when we hate each other we love each other the most then they both laughed and went out and walked along the unfrequented and grassy ways of the park are you going to the fulfords to-night asked isabel no they haven't asked me are you not if you are not i hate the parties that you don't go to to adapt an old bull you spoil half the parties by not being asked to them paul shrugged his shoulders it is my misfortune and not my fault for i am green with jealousy of every living soul who is invited to a party where there is a chance of meeting you isn't it funny said isabel meditatively how one person can make such a lot of difference paul seaton goes away for a day or two and london becomes as sparsely populated as the steppes of russia and as desolate as the great sahara paul seaton comes back again and the place is as crowded as if it were the scene of a jubilee procession or a royal wedding thank you said paul simply i am going to bring out a new arithmetic book continued isabel with problems such as these take one from five millions and only one remains and that one is yourself and very lonely paul laughed and isabel rattled on add one to two and the result is still two for the one is sadly de trop and so is shaken off as soon as possible what a clever mathematician it is said paul fondly you are rather a swell at mathematics yourself aren't you asked isabel i wasn't bad at them when i was at oxford 
yet my dear paul you are very slow at putting two and two together i have often noticed it because that is a higher branch than those in which i was proficient but wherein have i failed lately to satisfy the examiners on this score you don't always understand women me i mean do not blame oxford for that there was nothing in the least like you in the mathematics that i studied at the varsity they were dull stupid things with reason in them how horrid and when you put two and two together they invariably came to four continued paul can you imagine anything more tame and uninteresting nothing now what is the result of putting two and two together when you are dealing with me paul thought for a moment then he said sometimes five and sometimes a million one can never tell all one can tell for certain is that the result never will be four the only conclusion it is never safe to arrive at in dealing with a woman is the only logical one which do you like best me or mathematics my dear child what an absurd question which do you persisted isabel paul grew serious when i was at oxford i liked classics better than mathematics and rowing better than both of them after i left the varsity i began to care about power and success and fame more than about rowing now i love you more than power and success and fame put together with all the kingdoms of the world thrown in my dear old boy i only want to succeed now in order that i may have the more to offer to you continued paul i feel that money is worth getting because it will give you ease power because it will give you rank and fame because it will give you pleasure i used to care for these things for their own sake now i only care for them for yours and consequently i care ten times more for them than i used to do and am ten times more keen on winning them by jove if only i had edgar ford's chances wouldn't i make my wife one of the most envied women in london yet edgar will never do much said isabel i know he won't that is the pity of it if i were in edgar's place with all his advantages i would be in the government before i was forty as for him he will either not go into parliament at all or else throw up all chance of office by figuring as an independent member as if a great empire could be governed by a bundle of fads edgar is really an ascetic said isabel edgar is really an ass said paul isabel shook her head he is a perfect angel in some things and a perfect ass in others repeated her lover it is not always easy to tell the difference between an ass and an angel remarked isabel it confused balaam a good deal don't you remember when he thought that it was only an ass that was hindering him on his journey it turned out to be really the angel of the lord and balaam's is not an uncommon mistake sweetheart you are ingenious i was only trying to keep you from repeating balaam's blunder paul sighed it is the sort of blunder to which i am prone i should have been irritated with the creature if i had been balaam i know you would you are always so sure of yourself and you cannot bear to be thwarted but you shall be my angel dear and always stand in the way when you think i am wrong you could turn me back from anything isabel but you like edgar don't you isabel asked like him i should think i do i consider he is one of the best fellows under the sun and i have the greatest respect as well as affection for him but i cannot help thinking that he uses the microscope too much and the telescope too little figuratively speaking i know what you mean paul went on he is so strains his moral eyesight with splitting hairs that he is incapable of taking in a large general effect and he is apt to confuse prejudices with principles and crotches with creeds he is not content with conforming to the spirit of the law he will obey it in the letter as well i do not think you are just to edgar said isabel possibly not i am so much impressed by the necessity of attaining what is good and the impossibility of rising to what is perfect that it irritates me to see men neglecting an obvious duty for the sake of an impracticable dream do you think there is any danger of this in theoretical people i do replied paul of course i know that it is better to build a cathedral than to make a boot 
but i think it is better to actually make a boot than only to dream about building a cathedral it is far nobler to do great things than small things i admit but it is nobler to do small things than to waste all one's time in wanting to do great ones and to end by doing nothing at all edgar certainly is a theorist edgar was born several centuries too late continued paul in the early days of christianity he would have been an heroic martyr in the middle ages a cloistered saint just after the reformation a consistent puritan at the time of the evangelical revival an ideal early methodist but in the nineteenth century as the intellectual son of a wealthy merchant there seems no place for him you and i on the contrary are very modern aren't we paul old-fashioned things such as wigs and cows and martyrdoms would not have been at all becoming to us and then the lovers fell to talking about themselves and forgot edgar and everybody else in their absorption in the subject under discussion End of chapter thirteen